it's been feeling good. Like we've had neighbors pop in and people in Manitoba are pretty, pretty darn friendly. So <laughs> we still feel like we're in community, but there's like a piece around like, you know, I don't walk downtown and grab a cup of coffee anymore. Yeah, or, yeah. And yeah. so there are parts of me that miss that, like what you're saying, just like being out on a walk and, you know, and also just, just Kamloops. Once you've lived there for a while, it feels quite small. I mean, you just kind of know lots of people. You go that is both a blessing like, oh, and a curse. Like, I swear, like, probably like every fifth time I go out, I like see a client, which is like lovely and fantastic sometimes. And sometimes I'm just like, mm. oh man, I look disgusting. Not disgusting, but you know what I mean? Like, I don't feel professional. I don't feel like I'm like in a space yeah. where I would want someone to see me. So sometimes it's nice, like, oh, you go out almost every time and you see someone you know. But sometimes it's like, no, I just want to like that anonymity of a big city where like nobody knows you and you just like can be with people, but like no chance of seeing anyone you know. Yeah, totally. And I think that's, that's a, uh thing that I'm realizing now that I have to navigate in counseling in a small community. Like even yeah. though a big part of my practice is actually online, as I start to take on clients here, I mean, I'm going to be in community with them. And we talk about that as counselors, like working in smaller rural areas and the different challenges that come up. But now I'm like really seeing that, like what that's going to look like. Is, mm-hmm, you know, I'm mm-hmm. going to be in community probably with a lot of my clients and, and this idea of like separation between who you work with and who you like live in community with, that's not going to be something that yeah. I get to have. And yeah, there's a blessing in that and, and there's like a curse, like you said. So yeah, well, I'm sure we can talk more about that, but, um, so Cecile, <laughs> hi, hi, um, Obviously, I'm so excited to be here. I mean, I know we tried to do this before and it didn't it didn't work out very well. It didn't so, go too well. I mean, the, the conversation was amazing, but the audio didn't record on your end. And I'm really hopeful that today is better. Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> you know what? That being said, like from a, I don't know if it's selfish, but I'm like, don't ever record. And then we can just keep meeting all the time and doing these. And then from my perspective, I'm like blessed to get to talk to you more often. So I think that's that's okay for me. Yeah, you were so generous when we said that. And I love connecting with you. And, you know, I've missed I've missed being in the same space as you. And, you know, we were um, lucky to have at least it was not quite a year, but almost a year where we got to work. Yeah, just under in space together and get to know each other a bit more. And I think, you know, I've watched you over the last year just kind of grow and Um, change and and kind of build this beautiful practice and um, counseling resource for people both online and I think in Kamloops. And so I'm really excited to talk to you about what you've been up to and, um, you know, you as a counselor, but also you as a human, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I find you very fascinating and I think you're a lovely (laughs) human. Well, thank you. So with that being said, we know, I think I just uh, shared your counselor, mm-hmm. um, but tell us a bit about you. Who are you? What, what do you do and what do you love and where do your interests yeah. lie? So I'm certainly a counselor and I think that's like a big part of, of who I am, like a big part of um, uh, my identity, I guess. I don't have kids or anything like that yet. So I put like a lot of time into my business. That's like my little baby. Um so a lot of my my time goes there. Uh, outside of that, I've been training for a half marathon, which I've done one before, and I'm training for another one. So that's uh, that's really fun. That one comes with this fun piece for me because so my mom's maiden name is Annan. And growing up, I always had the message, Annans don't run because I have the body of an Annan, like a very classic Annan body type. And it was just like, Annans don't run. That's like the rule in the family. So like, I was expected to get like A's in every subject except for gym class because Annans don't run, like no point in even trying, like you can't do it. So that one's like a cool one for me of just like overcoming this like, um, you know, distortion that, or this belief that there's supposed to be something about Adams, right? So that one's a cool one for me to be just like overcoming and doing. And then I'm also training for a Spartan, which is like an obstacle course race. Mm -hmm. um, And that's going to be in the summer. And so kind of getting back into all of that since um, COVID, because that really, I had like all bunch of plans to do those type of things. And then COVID happened and knocked all of that out. So it's kind of cool to be reconnecting with that side because I feel so good when I do that. It's just really hard for me 
to do those things without, um, and when I say those things, I mean like workout in general without like mm-hmm. a goal or a reason. Like if I'm just working out for the sake of working out, I really, blah. it just doesn't feel worthwhile to me. But if there's like, oh, this is why I'm doing this thing, because when I can do this, I'll be able to do this obstacle better. Then it's easier for me to connect to it. Cool. So it's been really cool to have that in place again and like kind of nurturing that side of me again. And it's, and I know you didn't mention, but I think it's worth mentioning Rosie. Yes, I do have a golden retriever. Is it Rosa? No, Rosie, you're right. right. That's Kelsey's dog who's Rosa, which is why you're, why you're thinking that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Rosie, little golden retriever. She's uh, a bit of a brat, uh, but in like a cute (laughs) way. I keep waiting for her to grow up and everyone who has goldens tells me like, yeah, don't expect that till she's like 12. But I'm like, (laughs) kind of done with the puppy stage. She's like three and a half. I'm like, can we move out of puppy stage? But uh, yeah, no. She goes running with you and she, Yes. yes, yes. So I feel like she just needs to mention because, you know, she's your, she's your running companion right now. Yes. And she's she very is. cute. So, <laughs> so um, physical and physical stuff is a big part of what you're doing right now. Getting outside, mm-hmm. obviously mm-hmm. for running. Are you running outside? Yeah. Yeah. We've well, and what half marathon are that. you doing? It's going to be the BMO half in, so BMO Vancouver half marathon. I don't know what the exact title of it, but it's in Vancouver in May at some point and I kind of co-opted a group of friends to join me and all of them are just like I just told them we were signing up for this race um because that's kind of my style with my friends I'm just like hey guys we're doing this race in May and then we're like you know I'm not ready for a half marathon and I was like yeah me neither like we'll figure it out by the time we get there so cool. um yeah so I won't be doing that alone which is nice I'll have some companions on that that's cool that's that. really exciting I think I was 20 20- 22 and I ran my first half marathon nice, and I did the yeah. Lululemon Seawees. Okay. Yeah. And I loved having a goal as well. When you speak about like running and having, or, you know, doing physical fitness and having that kind of goal that you're looking towards that yeah. for me was a big part of training for the half marathon. And I remember yeah. when I decided to do the half marathon I was actually not doing very well and I was feeling like really unmotivated and struggling and it was like, okay, I need something. And at that point, like I wasn't a counselor then and I just knew I just need something to work towards. You know, yeah. I was unemployed. I felt crap in my body and I was like, okay, I'm just going to do a half marathon. And it was a lifesaver for me. Like that got me through. I think I trained, I trained for probably six months but it just provided me with a really nice structure mm-hmm. of physical exercise and getting outside and also a, an opportunity to challenge myself and build resiliency. And I, you know, I think it sounds like that might be part of what you're doing too, especially with Spartan. I think you like, you're obviously looking to build some resiliency. <laughs> <laughs> those I've done like plenty of those before. Oh, so those have. to me actually, okay. yeah, I've done like, I don't know, four Spartans before, I think three, four, something like that. So like those to me are almost like, not they're just normal now to me like I remember my first one was so much stress and anxiety about like oh what's this gonna look like and then mm-hmm. learning that oh okay this isn't as difficult as I anticipated it to be um you know it's all built up in the head and then when you actually just get out there and you just take it obstacle by obstacle and you're just like okay I think I can do this and if you can't the penalty is just 30 burpees and so you're like okay I can do 30 burpees and so you just oh, take it shit. one thing at a time and I don't know. Yeah. 30 burpees kind of scares me right now in my life. I'm like, I... <laughs> so right now, same. I don't think I could do 10 burpees without needing a break. But there's also something about like race day when you're just like, this is what I'm doing. And that's all you're doing that day. And so you're just like, okay, I'm just doing burpees. <laughs> you're just doing your thing over and over. The adrenaline comes in, right? And you're like, this totally. is my task and I'm going to do it. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, that sounds great. And so when you were saying about your business, I mean, it's so it's been so cool watching you um kind of build this online community and the creativity that I see that you're putting into all the stuff you're doing, you know, and I don't know if you identify it as being a creative thing. I think we've talked about this before, but from, you know, looking in, I see like, you know, the, the things that you're creating, the workshops and the, um, even just the graphics and things and the conversations that you're having with, um, your audience. It's really awesome, Cecile. And you're talking about really important stuff and, So I wanted to talk about that because one of the things that I see you talking a lot about is trauma. Mm -hmm. And are you finding that a lot of people are eating that up? Like what has been the response to all the trauma talk? Yeah. Yeah. um, Absolutely. So 
maybe I'll give a touch of background here of kind of mm-hmm. why I talk so much about trauma. Yes. Because given my own personal life, I went through a bunch of stuff that I was like, oh, this is life. This is whatever. This is fine. I'm fine. And you can even hear my voice, right? <laughs> like, I'm fine. <laughs> everything's okay. And when someone uses that tone of voice, like probably everything's not okay. Um, but I never would have said that was trauma. I would have been like, yeah, I had a tough childhood. Like it wasn't easy, but like, I'm fine, right? Um, later realizing through like counseling school and then all the pieces, you know, all the learning that's come after that, that like, oh, what I went through was actually trauma. I just think that we as a society don't necessarily know what trauma is. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will say, you know, trauma is like the car crash or a sexual assault, something like that. And maybe not realizing some other types of like abandonment trauma or neglect trauma and and those pieces and the impacts that can have on us later in life. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was something I saw in my practice so often was mainly women, but men as well, but mainly women coming in kind of being like, yeah, my childhood was fine, but like, I'm dealing with all this stuff and like, I can't connect to people. And like, I feel so alone all the time. And when we kind of look back and notice like, oh, actually like your dad was kind of abusive, for example, like maybe not in that really um, physical sense, but like he was abusive and maybe that connects to what you're doing now. And when we go heal that trauma, all the things that you're um, struggling with today, the symptoms shift. Yeah. And so that's kind of why I started that conversation because I was like, this is my journey a little bit of being like, oh, wait, this is trauma? Say what? And then seeing that so often in my practice and just loving doing that work, trying to share that with people, trying to redefine what trauma is, that it's not just you know going to war or um, a car crash, for example, that those absolutely are trauma, but that there's so much more to trauma that I think we... Um, as a society, maybe don't have enough conversation around, in my opinion. Yeah. So I do. I I see this normalization of trauma happening yeah. through the work that you're doing. And it not just normal like normalizing it, meaning that like, you know, a lot of us actually have trauma and um that it's not like you said, more information. So you're normalizing it, but you're also providing more information and understanding as to what trauma is because people get quite scared of that word. Mm -hmm. Um, And being, you know, when I, and especially in certain generations, and I would say like some of the clients, we even giggle about it that I work with that are, you know, above 40 or in their fifties. And I'll say, you know, like that sounds like it was quite traumatic. And then they're like, oh no, 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 no. That's, that's not, and I'm like, okay. So let's talk about what it means to have trauma because there's this stigma around like, oh, if I have trauma, then what does that mean about me, right? Yeah. Like the, what does yeah. that say about me? And there's a protection against wanting to identify about tr- with, with having trauma because yeah. of the stigma. And so with your conversations, you're really normalizing like, hey, there's lots of different ways that we can experience trauma, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and like a lot of us actually have it. Yeah. And I love what you said there about there's the stigmatization or this like belief that this says something about me. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say maybe that's even a reason for me that for so long I was like, no, I'm totally fine. There was nothing like it's okay. Because to admit that would also admit that there was like a lot of healing or a lot of work that needed to happen. And if I could say like, hey, there's nothing wrong, then I don't have to do any work. But like there was stuff wrong. I was dealing with the effects of what was wrong every day, but it was easier. It felt easier at the time to deal with those symptoms rather than admitting, hey, there's a lot of healing work, doing the hard work, and then coming out to the other side being like, oh, thank gosh. And I almost want to catch myself there. Obviously, there's no other side. Like this is a continual process, but getting to a point where a lot of those symptoms don't exist anymore for me at least. And I feel so much better. And I can look back and say like, okay, wow, that hard work really paid off. But at the time it felt like it was way easier to deal with the symptoms than to do that work. Right. And I think we, I think that there's a fear around like what that hard work is, Mm. you know? And like we talk about, it's like, okay, there's a lot of languaging around like, this is the deeper work. This is the harder work. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's harder because it means more vulnerability. Yeah, and absolutely. That's, and that's you know because we get really scared about doing that that deeper work, but it's I think the scarier part about it is the vulnerability that's required to do some of that earlier difficult work. You know the mm-hmm. the, the stuff mm-hmm. that or I say earlier, but I mean like earlier in our life, some of that childhood yeah. stuff can feel very vulnerable, mm-hmm. um, and it can feel mucky. Right, that's why it can feel hard. And. I love what you're saying there. Uh, Like great point in tossing that in there of like, yeah, there's this huge vulnerability. And something I try and share with clients if they're at that point is that 
we're going to pace it. It's not going to be like the first day that you come into your session. It's like, let's talk about your relationship with your dad or your mom or whatever it might be like first session. Like part of trauma therapy is pacing it and setting it at an appropriate pace for you as the guide to set that rather than us being like, let's dive right in. Well, that could be re-traumatizing or that could be more harmful. And we're going to set a pace that feels appropriate to you going where you're ready to go and, and maybe challenging you a little bit, but like, let's not dive into the deep end and make it worse for you. Right. Yes, absolutely. That's really um, a big, a big part of trauma therapy, like you said, and building attachment with your, mm-hmm. um, with your therapist or connection or like a good working relationship before you go to those places. So, you know, if, if someone who's listening is thinking like, oh, I'm scared of the deeper work, the deeper work, or I'm, you know, I, I don't really want to go there. I don't want to bring up those memories. It's like, well, they show up in your day to day usually. <laughs> whether you're aware of it or not, whether that's yeah. like in how you relate. So you're going, you know, it's impacting you. Um, but when you're ready to go there, you'll go there with support. Yeah. Right. And part of the work in counseling is getting you to a place where you're ready to go there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this trauma, so you've been talking a lot about complex post-traumatic stress, right? Yes. CPDST yes. is what your hashtag is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you don't mind, Cecile, I'm just, I'm, I want you, you're so good at explaining stuff. <laughs> I want you to talk Thanks. a little bit about the complex PTSD and, yeah. um, you know, like, cause that's been a big part too, is there's like trauma, but then there's like complex trauma. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So can you um, decipher for us? Yeah, absolutely. I like to kind of do that by comparing and contrasting a little bit to PTSD, um, mm-hmm. where so trauma is this event that happens. We all enter traumatic states fairly often where our body goes into this fight, flight, or freeze response, and our body gears up to protect ourselves from something. Now, naturally, what should happen is that we're then going to be able to complete the cycle of the fight, flight, or freeze. So we're going to kind of discharge that energy from our body and move back into a rest and digest state. What can happen is that that trauma, um, we might not be able to step out of that fight, flight, or freeze uh, response. And once that lingers for, correct me if I'm wrong, it's six months? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I could be wrong on the number there. But once it sticks around for a certain amount of time, I believe it's six months, um, we get it can now be called PTSD or CPTSD. Yes, I think now, it's six months. Yeah. yeah, I think it's six. Okay. So PTSD usually happens for one, from one or maybe two traumatic events. So for example, maybe you've been in a couple of car crashes and those lead to PTSD or maybe one sexual assault that leads to PTSD. Whereas complex post-traumatic stress disorder or CPTSD, it's the accumulation of many, many, many traumas or ongoing neglect, ongoing abuse, ongoing trauma. And so that would be something like, you know, growing up in an abusive household for, you know, the first say 18 years of your life or 15, if you move out early, or it might be having an abusive partner for let's say five years. It's not going to be one moment of trauma, like the car crash. What I find especially um, important to know about CPTSD versus PTSD PTSD, we can often have a before and after. Here's who I was before the event. Here's who I was after. And here's what I can see the changes as. With CPTSD, because it's often developmental and happening in our childhood, we don't know who we are without that. Mm -hmm. So there ends up with a lot of identity work of, wait, but who am I? Because I've actually been living, believing that I'm a very shy, quiet person my whole life. But wait, maybe I just lived in a household where I couldn't speak up and I wasn't allowed to talk. That was dangerous. And so I became quiet because that was protective. It was actually a trauma response to protect myself. And so we need to figure out, well, who are you now? Are you a quiet person? Are you actually a really boisterous, loud person who learned to be quiet because that was safer for you? That's such a good explanation, Cecile. Thank Thank you. you. That's something I explain. (laughs) Often in my practice, I feel like that's almost a rehearsed little speech that I give there. Good though. It's good because I think that's really, you know, especially for individuals that might've had a chaotic or unstable childhood or had um, many small events, not necessarily small in impact, but like smaller events over, they, yeah. they can say like, oh yeah, like that was just life. Like you had said, that's just, that's not a big trauma. That was just how it was. And and this idea yeah. of like, that's how it was, is part of our resource and part of our coping yes. because yeah. like- <laughs> If, if we don't accept that and we've experienced ongoing trauma, um, that can be even more painful than just accepting like, this is just how life is, right? Yeah. 
And then that yeah. identity that we form around our trauma, there is a lot of resource, like you had already mentioned, in that like um, adaptability can be a big mm-hmm. one for people, right? In a certain way, like uh, reading the room and reading um, other people can be a resource that you've gained in experiencing a lot of different trauma um, in your childhood, right? So I think yeah. one of the challenges in people identifying as having trauma is that they want how do I want to say this? It's like that that negates the strength that you've acquired in the situation, right? When it's like, we need to hold both of these as true. Yeah. There's been a great amount of resource that you gained from experiencing and moving through some of these things. And there's impacts. I can, you know, share in my story, I know that I became this overachieving perfectionist because that was the best way in my family not to be not to receive any criticism, any harm was to be this like high achieving, perfect, saying in quotation marks, perfect child. Um, And that became something that I really loved, right? I love that about myself that like I was super high achieving. I, um, I finished my BA and my master's degree in five years because it was just like, you better, like you can't do a master's degree isn't good enough. How are you going to do that better than everyone else? Well, your grades wouldn't be good enough because other people can get good grades too. Like, how are you going to do this above and beyond everybody else? Right. That was kind of my, and that's a piece of myself that I can say I'm proud of. Like, I'm proud that I had these capacities to do these things while also recognizing that it was this really protective factor for me, that it yes. wasn't only because I wanted to push myself and see what I could achieve. It was very much, how is this going to prove that I'm a good enough human being mm-hmm. that I deserve love and care and attention? Well, if I can do all these accomplishments, well, then I deserve your care. Then I'm a good enough person. Right. And so there's this strength there. And it also came from a place of real hurt. Yes. That's, yes, exactly. And how can we, you know, acknowledge our strength and also acknowledge the impact and look at ourselves and ask ourselves, like, you know, who am I outside of those experiences, you know, like are you, you're more than just your perfectionist behaviors, right? Yeah. And that's probably part of the work that you've also done. And I know for me personally, a big part of who I became based on my experience was someone who mediated situations and mm. caregived people and um, knew how to make people feel good, laugh, perform. You know, those are all parts of how I coped and how I felt to be more resourceful. And as I get Mm -hmm. older and work on my trauma, I start to realize like, am I really that extroverted? You know, Mm -hmm. am I, you know, am Mm -hmm. I, so it's those questions like who, you know, if I, if I'm not trying to make other people happy, who am I? Yeah. Yeah. I, what a beautiful example (laughs) of, yeah. Who am I? That's really that developmental piece that I was talking about of like, who am I outside of those things? But I love the alignment there. I was kind of chuckling to myself, knowing you well, knowing that you're an artist who performs, knowing that you're a counselor who mediates, not that you mediate per se, but all those aligned pieces, but also you're brilliant at your job, right? That there's maybe these came as protective factors, but they've also served you really well in terms of who you are today. And it doesn't necessarily mean just because they came from trauma. Now you can't perform because that would be a trauma response. Like, no, you can obviously still perform. You can still do all those pieces you love. And also recognizing that maybe there's a part that came as that protective mechanism. Right. And that it's not the only way that I can receive affirmation and value Mm -hmm. in who I am. And I think that's the piece that you said. And, you know, I know as well, like I want to, I want to support people in my community and be a counselor and I want to write music and perform, but my value as a person is not dependent on that or, you yes, know, the ease yes, of yes, my yes. life is not dependent on me doing those things anymore. And I get to choose. That's the other thing. It's like the choice. Yeah. I get yeah. to choose. I don't have to do this for safety, emotional safety anymore. I can do this for pleasure. And well, that's, yes, a, thank you. that's like a difference. You hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. That is absolutely about choice that I still choose to do a lot of business things and push myself because it feels purposeful to me. And I love having a goal, but if I don't do it, if I take a week off, I'm not like, Oh my gosh, I don't have worth anymore. Or nobody's going to love me. It's not like that anymore. Whereas for sure at a point, like if I wasn't working hard at school, I believed that I was going to be an unlovable human being if I didn't push harder at school. And now there's this choice. Would I like to do this versus like, I have to do this. Yeah. And you know, Cecile, sorry, something came up when you were speaking there about like you believed that you were unlovable, an unlovable um, human being. And Mm -hmm. I just want to talk about this 
in particular, because when I work with clients about this, they'll say, well, I don't think I'm not good enough. Right. And so some of these thoughts that we have are not conscious, meaning that they're not like, mm-hmm. we don't actually think I'm not good enough. That's not like some people do. Don't get me wrong. Sure. But some of these kind of um, embedded self beliefs are deeper and mm-hmm. they have all these other kind of ways that they show up, not necessarily in that language of like, I'm unlovable, but it might show mm-hmm. up as mm-hmm. like um, anxiety, like immense anxiety when you're not overachieving. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah. so you know, you might not have this thought, I'm unlovable when I'm not doing my homework. It's more like (laughs) I have immense anxiety and I can't settle down and I can't, you know, so that belief tends to be buried. Mm -hmm. And part Mm -hmm. of the work of counseling is figuring out what are these beliefs that are are operating, that are like in your operating system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great point that now I say that, but at the time I did not know that. Now I can see why I was doing it. I have the language to speak around it. But at the time, it didn't even feel like a choice to perform at a high level. Mm -hmm. It was just that I couldn't not, because if I stopped, it was such massive anxiety that it was just like, well, why would I stop? Right. And also for me, there was this really um, a lot of validation, a lot of praise when I was doing all these things, because there's this, um, you know, external support for people going to university and pushing hard and doing those things. Right. Um, But yeah, I had no idea of the language. Like I couldn't have told you like, yeah, I feel unlovable. And that is why I'm pushing so hard. And why, you know, when I got um, in my whole degree, I got one B and you better believe I cried my eyes out around that B because that B in archaeology, I can still tell you the professor, like that meant that I was a horrible human being. Right. right. But I didn't have that language then. Right. And that's part of the work is building the awareness around like what, yeah. you know, what are these behaviors that we're, we're engaging in and how are we showing up in the world and what's, what parts of ourselves are, are, are running that? Like, what is it the wounded parts of ourselves? Is it, yeah. is it that old stuff that is, you know, showing up and, and impacting how we, how we show up, you know, and that's, that's the, that's the kind of pathway to the deeper work. It's like figuring mm-hmm. this stuff out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks for clarifying that with me. Cause that comes up a lot, you know, like clients will be like, I I don't think that about myself. And then I'm like, okay. And then you start to kind of pull back the layers and it's like, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. I guess I do not feel good enough most of the time. Right. And it's like, those are big aha moments. Yeah. I think for a lot of people too, finding that exact language is really important because to me, quite honestly, a lot of them seem very similar, right? If you say I'm not good enough or I'm bad or I'm a loser, like those might sound the same, but I think for the person finding the one that resonates, those that word can actually really matter. Um, for me, I wouldn't have said ever, I'm uh, maybe I would have said a bit, I'm not good enough, but it was very much I'm unlovable. And mm-hmm. that came through everything that I went through. I'm unlovable was what resonated with me. And that's where the work had to be. And I think, you know, if I had done work on I'm not good enough, Sure, there would have been benefit there, but we wouldn't have been able to get to the core of what was going on. It wouldn't have been so tender, right? It's like exactly it's like yeah, finding yeah. that tender spot. And like for me, mine is I'm too much. Like mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. I'm too much or I'm a burden. They're kind of mm-hmm. similar in a way. So mm-hmm. those are two that I, I work with a lot as well. And you know, this segues us beautifully into EMDR because <laughs> a big part of EMDR treatment is figuring out what is that negative message. thought, right? Yeah. What is that message? What is that thing that, that is, has become part of your story mm-hmm. about who mm-hmm. you are? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we're both EMDR therapists and I know we're both super dang passionate about it. Yeah. Are you doing lots of EMDR these days? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely where it's relevant. It seems right now, currently in my practice, a lot of folks are either, um, we're kind of just past that EMDR stage where we've done a lot of the EMDR and now it's the integration of like, okay, mm-hmm. we've like, changed a lot of these beliefs about yourself. Who are you now? Which is why I think I mentioned that earlier, because that just so happens to be where I'm at actually with a lot of my folks right now is more at that integration phase rather than the EMDR. So I would say I have a lot of clients who I kind of just wrapped up EMDR with. Awesome. And that's, I love how you speak about that. And although it's not linear and we've said that many times, um, there is this piece around like, you know, that beginning work, looking at symptoms, looking at your past, creating awareness, Um, starting to um, see the full picture kind of, it's like opening your eyes to the full picture of like what's impacted you. And Mm -hmm. then it's the pro like the healing of the trauma, the wounds, and then it's the integration. It's like, 
okay, now that that trauma is healed, who do you want? Who are you? What do you want? What, like, mm-hmm. what, are, what are your desires? And I like to talk about, it's like attuning to pleasure, attuning to desire, attuning to, you know, that's kind of the work that we do after we do the trauma healing. It's like, how yeah, can you yeah. now embrace and enjoy your life? Yeah, absolutely. Like what's next for you now that you're not in this trauma response all the mm-hmm. time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so EMDR, eye movement, reprocessing and desensitize. Oh, is it the other way? Re- Desensitization and reprocessing. Oh Same man. Lack of sleep. <laughs> Lack of sleep. <laughs> New baby. It's allowed. It's allowed. Oh, bear with me, people. I'm not good with facts. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I mean, I also do a lot of EMDR and I've been doing a lot online. Um mm-hmm. and actually I'm in a phase right now. It's where I'm back into doing a lot of EMDR with people. Mm. So I have Mm -hmm. moved from doing that integrative piece and have some newer clients and people that I've been working with for a long time. And now we're like, we're diving into the trauma healing. And um, it's always funny to me explaining to people EMDR right off the bat, because it's- (laughs) It's so hard because um, it sounds so crazy. It does. It and I, sounds hooey dooey to use that word of like, it sounds like. Um, sounds woo woo, man. It sounds yeah, like. Great word for it. Great word for it. Very woo woo. Yeah, it does. But it it's sounds like it's. Based, is, is the important thing. It's so research based. It's so neurological. And yet it sounds like this woo woo thing where like, just move your eyes back and forth and it'll all fix. And it's like, no, actually there's so much research and there's so much depth to this. Yes, there is. And so I, you know, and I think because I, I fear that it sounds too woo woo, I always end up overcompensating by being like, it's really research based. And like on my website, you can find a research a library where you could look it up. And, you know, um, it's so research based that ICBC approves it. It's like, I'm like, you know, trying to explain, but yeah, one of the ways that I, I do the same, do you do the same? Yeah. I have a handout that I will send people once we talk about EMDR, if they're like, interested in it I'll like email them this handout that has all the facts and all the details to be like I promise this is research based this isn't me just making it up and I talk about how the World Health Organization the WHO has approved it as like number one treatment modality for trauma I'm like if the WHO approves it you know it's real like right that's how I but the exact same thing as you like I don't want you to think this is woo woo here's the facts on it right exactly but it's you know one of the words or ways that I've been explaining it recently um I've been talking about it as a bit of a biohack you know it's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. Because what we're doing is we're bringing on the body's own mechanisms of processing. We're just like asking those mechanisms to come forth at a very specific time and we're recalling very specific moments and then getting the body to do its work at that time. So that's been, because that's a kind of a buzzword these days, biohacking. So I'm like, Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. like a biohack because it is, I mean, you know, this left, right, um, this bilateral stimulation that we're doing with eye movements or tapping, you know, that happens naturally for us mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in our REM should sleep. We explain what it, what it is right now. Like, should we yeah. explain? What Why don't you like explain it? it? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sure. So once we do all the work that Dee and I have been talking about of all the prep work, we're then going to choose a moment and a belief that's associated with it. So I'm going to make it, you know, let's say that, um, Let's, let's use a car crash because I think yeah. that's like a pretty easy, straightforward one. Um, let's say that you're in a car crash and from that car crash, you develop the belief, I am not safe or I'm in danger. Maybe that's your belief. What we're going to do is we're going to think about that memory while we as the clinician are moving our fingers in front of your eyes or different um, therapists have uh, light bars. So it's a light that moves and you follow the light with your eyes. We can tap on your knees or there's something called buzzies, which are these two little things you hold in your hand and they buzz in your left and then your right, left and then your right. But basically it's always about left, right, left, right, left, right. And you think about that traumatic memory for a moment and the belief that you have associated with it. We turn off, so to speak, your frontal lobe or we distract the conscious part of your brain so that the deeper part of your brain can do the work that it needs to do to start to shift you from, you know, maybe I'm not safe to the new belief, which might be I'm safe or I'm alive now or I'm okay, whatever resonates for that person. And we just do that in short little spurts, you know, anywhere between maybe 10 seconds and 30 seconds of thinking about the trauma with the buzzies in your hand or while your eyes are moving back and forth. Uh, You think about it for a moment, step out of it, step back into it, out in, out in, until we can actually watch the, the trauma level or how sensitive you feel to that belief of, you know, I'm not safe. We can watch that drop and we can see the new belief. I am safe. I'm alive now, whatever it might be kind of growing up. And you're believing that one more and more. Did that kind of explain it? it? I always struggle to explain EMDR. 
Yeah, no, I think that's that's really good. And I think that that explanation can give people a visualization of what's actually happening in session. And this, you know, I also like to add that when we have a traumatic experience, it's like it gets, our nervous system doesn't process it, our brain mm-hmm. and our nervous system doesn't process it because it is so overwhelming. It, it yeah. doesn't fully process it, right? And so it's like it gets stuck in our working memory and it's like alarm bells so that mm-hmm. when something similar happens, then the alarms go off or something that we perceive as similar happens. Yeah. The alarm yeah. bells go off to be like, okay, go back to safety. This is not good. This is not good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so part of EMDR is taking that experience from the working memory and putting it into the long-term memory. And when we yeah. tax the the brain with the eye movements or the tapping, that's what happens as well. Yeah. So it's like, it's going and it's like, okay, we're processing it. And we're, we're kind of like, like you said, Going, it still just, feels like it's happening in the present, even though it's not happening in the present, right. a part of our brain thinks it is. And so we help store it in the long-term memory so that your brain can go, ah, yes, that happened in the past. It's not still happening right now. Right. And you have more adaptive thinking about it. And yes. I think yeah. that's the biggest part or the most exciting part about being an EMDR cl- clinician and using it in my practice is getting to see people develop adaptive thinking about some of these traumatic events and how it happens in EMDR. It's just like, it's so cool because, you know, we're not feeding it to them in any way. It's like literally the body, sometimes we can help it along if there's some stuckness, but like yeah, yeah. the brain and the body does it on its own. It's like, as you're going mm-hmm, through EMDR, mm-hmm. if there's an, a sexual assault, for, in, for instance, that we're processing, I love it when I see someone be like, oh, that's not my fault. Yes. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And then you're like, yeah, it wasn't your fault. <laughs> but we, what I found, so I, if I can, I want to share a little story with you because I love this. Um, I had a practicum, I have a practicum student right now. And with permission from a client, she came and observed an EMDR session. And at the end, her and I were talking about kind of what happened and all these things. And she said that the client had a moment and I won't exactly share what was said, but let's say it's the moment there with the sexual assault of, oh, this is not my fault. And she said, oh, you two must have talked about that before. And it finally clicked for her today. And I was like, no, no, we never talked about this. This is not something that we discussed beforehand. And she was like, wait, so that, that came from the client? That was fully them? And I was like, yeah, we've never talked about whose fault it was or anything like that. The client had that capacity within them. They just weren't able to bring that over to that traumatic memory yet but in the emdr through the emdr that adaptive thought was able to come to that trauma and say like hey this isn't about me it wasn't my fault and it was just so cool to observe her being like that was all the emdr because i guess a little bit it's normalized for me now i've done it so many times but for her as a first timer watching this she was just like awestruck that like you guys didn't set this up the emdr the client completely did that on their own yeah it is remarkable. I think yeah. that is the coolest thing about EMDR. Absolutely. And that's such a good example because I do think we get desensitized a bit to it because we do it so often unless yeah. there's like a yeah. really big one. But mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. that just shows that it's it's your it's your own body doing it. So it's not hip, like some people uh, compare it to being hypnotized mm. and it's not, mm-hmm. you know, no. I think that you know, I've had people say like, oh, so you put people in a trance and it's like, no, you know, we're not feeding any sort of thoughts to the clients. Um, sometimes we can help when they're stuckness and ask a particular question that can kind of guide them, guide them into um, thinking about it maybe a little bit differently, but never really feeding these adaptive thoughts. And um, you're fully present during EMDR. You're not sleeping. You're not mm-hmm. in a trance. Mm-hmm. You're not hypnotized. Um so I just like to say that because I've had lots of people. Yeah. Ask as soon that. as you hear these eye movements, you think that your yeah. eyes are moving back and forth following someone's finger. It does sound kind of like hypnosis in the setup, but it is not at all like that. You're fully conscious the entire time. Um, yeah, yeah, you're you're in full control the entire time. Yeah, and it's so remarkable. And I mm-hmm. I've been doing it online and I mm-hmm. use a program and that's been really cool too, like being able to offer EMDR to people that are in remote locations and don't have access to EMDR clinicians. So this online um, piece has been really cool in making Mm -hmm. EMDR more accessible. Mm. And I've loved how with online, I can change the color, you know, there's a ball that goes across the screen. So then I can, I can add, I can change the color of the ball. I can add sound, I can uh, change the speed. And so those pieces sometimes actually work better for certain clients. So that's been cool. And I, that's, I think 
a big thing about EMDR is that it works with technology is what I'm saying too. It's, it's like, it's accessible and it's, it's available and it can, it could do a lot of healing, you know, with this modality, we can heal a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to ask you something else about EMDR. Just wait, let me think. I might've lost it. Um, Okay, I have a question for you. With EMDR, what would you... No, I'm not going to ask that question. Okay, sorry. I'm just, <laughs> okay, I'm, okay. just <laughs> I'm just thinking about um, if there's anything left about EMDR that we should explain or touch on for people because I know this is this is a big interest and I can imagine that I'll share this podcast with people that are interested in doing it. Right. I mean, something that I, with my work with CPTSD, like to talk about with people. Um, because we've kind of been talking about EMDR from almost a PTSD perspective, where yes. it's like, here's one event that we need to desensitize and that we need to process. Um, with CPTSD, what we've been talking about is that there's not one event. There's right. not just one event that led to your belief. And so important to note that we still can use EMDR for CPTSD. I do that a lot. And Me rather too. than targeting, targeting one specific memory, I tend to just target the belief more and lean into the belief more and allow it to bring us to the memories that we need to go to. So if I'm doing EMDR for a car crash, we're going to target the car crash. We're going to think about the car crash parts of the car crash. But if we're doing it for, you know, ongoing abuse uh, or neglect, what we would do is target it from the belief. So maybe, you know, we've been talking about, you know, uh, I'm too much or I'm unlovable. We would target more through that belief rather than through the memory as much, because there's not one memory per se that is going to be the one that we need to do. But if we kind of go through that belief and we target this belief and do EMDR around the belief, it can shift it in a lot of the memories. So it's just a bit of a different way to do it. And I think it's important just to know that we can do it for CPTSD. It's not something that we would exclusively use. So if you're kind of like, I don't have a memory that I need to process, okay, that's fine. Maybe it's like a lifetime of memories and we can do that as well. Right. And so you'll use the belief to help the client recall memories of like when they had that belief, right? Yeah. It'll, it'll connect to the proper memories rather than trying them to figure out what memories need processing. It's like, let's target the belief and you will take me to the memories that matter rather than us deciding beforehand. It's in the EMDR that we identify what needs to be processed. Yes. Yes. That does. And that's an important piece. Thanks, Cecile. You're so easy to interview. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You're helping me, sister. Um, No, but that's a big thing because I think people come in to EMDR and they think, well, I don't remember anything or um, I don't know what was traumatic. And it's like, what I like to say is a big part of EMDR because we're using your body and like to do the healing and we're just kind of asking these pieces to come on board. It's like trusting your brain and your body to bring up what needs to be processed. And that can happen as you're saying, by just starting the treatment and then the brain will just kind of bring up these things. Or we have certain exercises that can help a client recall um, the memories. And so Mm -hmm. you don't have to come to therapy being like, this is a memory that's traumatic. Um, In fact, part of the work is actually uh, figuring that out together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And something I find a lot is that um, with with EMDR for CPTSD, we'll often do EMDR and then they'll remember something they've never remembered before. Yes. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, like I now am remembering four years old Christmas, this event. And it's like, maybe we didn't have the capacity or the space to handle that memory beforehand, but now we have that space for it. And so now it's coming up to be processed. That's right. And that's that piece of trusting, you know, trusting your brain and your body to bring up what needs to happen. Yeah, exactly. um, Or what needs to be processed. And, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say, I remember it's came back to me is that for individuals that are feeling really, um, nervous, to do that deeper work or to talk about traumatic events, EMDR can be so good because you don't have to do talk therapy about it. Absolutely. You, know? you don't even have to share with your clinician all the details of an event. You can just you know, share some key points of an image. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so for individuals that feel more cautious about sharing some really tender things, um, EMDR can be really good. Obviously, you want to make sure there's a relationship with the therapist and there's trust there. But even when there's a lot of trust, if there's some complex PTSD um, 
there can be certain scenarios that a client doesn't want to share the details of Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. EMDR can be really good for that too. Cause we don't have to sit and talk about it. We don't have to process it. And even for people that really like have this aversion to, and how does that make you feel? Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is like the, the um, catchphrase for counseling that people are like, Oh, I don't want to go to a counselor. Ask me how I feel. It's like, guess what? EMDR is great for you. I mean, we do actually ask that question in the MDR, but we yeah. don't have to process it endlessly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think when I did my EMDR training, they actually talked about, they called it the ghost protocol, but it's exactly that where they can use EM or, or I haven't done this personally because I don't work with first responders, but for first responders who might not be allowed to talk about the details of a case because maybe they're the, the attending police officer and they're not allowed to share with anybody what happened we can still do trauma therapy with them without actually us as the clinician knowing really what was happening. Um, so to any extent, there's there's protocols that are set in place that we don't, yeah, have to dive into all the details of it. Which again, just makes this this therapy so accessible. Um, That's exactly it, yeah. To various individuals. And so it's, it's I, I just love EMDR. And obviously mm-hmm. because you do too, we both have dedicated a big part of our, Um, time and energy as clinicians to learning more and supporting individuals with it. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty passionate about it and passionate about some of the um, benefits I've seen from EMDR. And, you know, I know we talked about this in our podcast that didn't, didn't, didn't work. (laughs) Yeah, Um, Yeah. But the interesting thing about the impact of EMDR is that sometimes you'll be able to see really like specific results from it. Like for instance, if you're doing something for PTSD, like a car crash, I've seen clients who can't get into cars or um, they get into a vehicle and then they have a panic attack. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. After we do EMDR, they can actually drive. Right. So that's like a very tangible, like, look, this is a... um, a positive impact of EMDR therapy, I can now get in my car and drive. Or, you know, I, if you're scared, if you had a house fire and you can't sleep in your bed, you can only sleep on the couch. After you do EMDR, you might actually be able to sleep in your bed. Yeah. Um, But sometimes, especially if we're doing more complex PTSD, um, it can be hard to see super tangible, like right away, like, oh, look, this is an EMDR. This is from EMDR. I'm not saying there hasn't been impacts. And so one of the things that has happened is I'll do this like EMDR with a client and they'll come in. And I'll be like, so what did you notice? And say we were processing like early childhood abuse and they show up and they have really big challenges in relationship, like trusting their partners mm-hmm. or like mm-hmm. being in an abusive relationship as an adult. So we do EMDR. And they come in and I'm like, so have you noticed any impacts like since we started EMDR? And they'll be like, no, I don't know. I don't know if EMDR is working, but I do want to share. I recently broke up with my boyfriend and I, (laughs) you know, and I'm feeling really good about it. Like that was an abusive situation and I'm feeling like super empowered. And now, and then I'm like, "Mm -hmm." so let's talk about how that might actually be (laughs) an impact of EMDR. Right. So it's like, you can see these impacts show up, but they're um, more, they're underwhelming in a sense. They're not like, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think even, even your example there, if I broke up with my boyfriend, I would say that one even feels like a big one to me because yes. I've had it with like clients come in and they'd be like, yeah, India is not really helping, but you know what? My kid today, she did that thing after school that she always does. And like today it just didn't really bug me. Yes. And I'll be like, oh, how come? Oh, well, because in the past I, I had a belief it meant I'm a bad mom. And like, now it doesn't feel like I'm a bad mom when that happened. That's just what she's going through. And I'm like, oh, interesting. Like, do we maybe see this connection, right? Because yes. it can be so subtle that it's just like, hey, my normal response in this situation has shifted because we're changing that underlying belief about who you are or what that means about you. And so then you can choose to respond differently in situations. But it's not in your face obvious. It's just like, oh, my kid did that thing and I didn't blow up like I usually would, yes. right? And it yes. might just seem like nothing's happening, but there's actually a lot happening at that deeper level. Yeah. And your nervous system is healed, right? Because around those situations, you're, you're not being triggered, you know, that Mm -hmm, word triggered, mm -hmm. you're not being put into a state of like overstimulation because of it, because you've healed the the trauma and the nervous system around those types of events. So your nervous system isn't getting into this heightened fight or flight state in those scenarios. Yeah. Um, And you're not thinking about it. And this is the cool part about EMDR is that like, you're not willing yourself in change in the moment. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's, and that is so fucking relieving because sometimes when you're doing the work, you're constantly trying to like override so these behaviors and, and reactions. And when we can't do that, 
that's a good indication that this is rooted in trauma, right? So, wow, beautiful way to say it. And that's, that's why, so I used to do a lot of cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Um, and I would hit up against that same point over and over again, where clients would know what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to think. And they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't. And then it leads to the shame piece, this failure piece. I'm not mm. trying hard enough. When the reality is there's nothing wrong with you. There's a trauma response going on. And that's actually where I decided to get my EMDR training because I was like, there is something so much deeper going on here that we cannot change by the way that we think. We yes. can't think our way out of this. But when I do the deeper level healing, well, now I just naturally do all those things that I was trying so hard in CBT to do. I naturally think in the way that I was forcing myself to think, well, now it's just happening because I've healed those underlying deeper levels. And so now my thoughts just kind of come naturally and I don't have to force anything anymore. Yeah. And it's such a relief, especially for people that have been, you know, really trying to do the work. They've been doing self-healing. They've been reading. They're thinking, well, I'm just supposed to think positively in this situation. Yeah. or I'm just supposed to be mindful and take a breath right now. Or, you know, and then they're just yeah. like, I'm <laughs> yeah. broken because it's not working. I'm and not doing like, it right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's something wrong with me because I've been, yeah. you know, doing all this personal work and, you know, setting all these goals and I just, I don't have the willpower and I can't do it. Yeah. It's like, no, yeah. that's like when you can... I like to explain it this way. When you can see yourself behaving, it's like, you know, sometimes the first part of counseling is like developing that observer and developing yeah. the awareness. But when you can observe yourself and then you're, you want, you don't want to behave in certain ways, but you're like watching yourself and you can't mm -hmm. stop mm -hmm. yourself, no matter mm -hmm. what you tell yourself, mm -hmm. that's a good indication that we're dealing with some nervous system, trauma, deeper stuff. Yeah. Beautiful it, explanation there. That when you can see it happening, but you can't stop it, there's something else going on. Yeah. Great explanation. Yeah. yeah. It's not it's about your willpower. Sure, because I've never explained it that way, but like a hundred percent, that's stealing that one. Yeah. Well, because it's like, and I think I say that because I experienced it for so long, mm. you know, like a big part of my journey has becoming a yoga instructor first, uh, meditation and doing that and doing a lot of like self-healing stuff before counseling school and even in the beginning of counseling school and then like building the awareness and then seeing all the behaviors and seeing all the things that I'm doing that aren't healthy mm -hmm. and then being in that place where you're aware but unable to stop yourself that is in my opinion the most uncomfortable part of personal growth because you're aware that it's not healthy but you can't stop yeah and you have no idea what to do about it Right. That's You're right. just like, and, and for me, at least in, in my journey, the shame, yes. Ugh, I'm not doing it right. Like you said, I'm broken. I can't figure out, I know the thing. So I must not be trying hard enough. I'm doing something wrong. And remember my message of this, like overachiever perfectionist, mm. who's now not able to fix herself, even though she has all the knowledge and all the tools, like ugh, such a distressing, hard place to be. Yes. So for people to know that, Hey, maybe there's something deeper going on and maybe these, um, kind of thought level therapies aren't going to work for you because there is that deeper piece. I think just knowing that could be really relieving for someone that I'm not broken. I'm not wrong. There's something else going on. Yeah. That this is, this is way bigger than intellectual, right? Like this exactly. is an embodied, this is a, and you know, I like to use that language a lot around like nervous system and body. Like this is more like, this is in your nervous system. This is in your body. And those other ways of thinking are not accessible right now. Yeah. And so you can't, yeah. you can't access it. And that's, that's why it's happening. But so if you're in that place right now where you're like, you see what's happening, but you can't stop the train. <laughs> Just know there might be something bigger happening and yeah. there are uh, therapies that can support that healing as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And so finding a therapist who has uh, that, that type of practice or that type of training that allows that so that you can do that work and not just, and, and I don't want this to sound bad against CBT. I, like I say, I'm trained in it. I think it can be a beautiful modality to a point, but recognizing that if you go to a therapist who's just going to get you to do that, you might keep feeling like you're broken. And so yeah. maybe looking for someone who can help you do some of that deeper work um, or, or a different type of work, I guess, is what it is. That can be super helpful. Yeah. And then CBT can be more accessible, right? It's like, it's when you have done that work, it's like, then you can actually might be able to support yourself on that more cognitive level once you've mm -hmm. done the trauma work. And mm -hmm. this is why it's so nice as a therapist to have all these, like not too many, because I think that can be overwhelming, but to have different tools to support people in different places. 
Absolutely. And I think that's a big job, at least in my opinion, as the therapist, is to be able to have different tools and to recognize where are you um, and, and to match my modality to the client's needs, right? That's and great. to not say that I only do this type and you have to fit this, but more I can adapt me to using, okay, right now you're here, I'm going to use this modality. And as your process changes, as your journey continues, now I need to start introducing this one more and let's start using this. Yeah. Um, so that no matter where a client's at, we can support them and not try and fit them into our box of what we know, but how do we mold into who you need us to be almost or, or bring right. what you need from us. Right. Exactly. And obviously within reason, but it's like... Yes, of course. Yes. But yeah, it's important to have those different tools. And I mean, when we start doing the work, counseling and stuff, it can feel really nice to have uh, modalities like CBT that have homework and have, you know, when we're building that awareness, it can feel really good to you know, get into things from that more cognitive level, mm -hmm. that's nice mm -hmm. and safe and it can be yeah. a good introduction. And then, you know, as we move into trauma work, um, it's just less structured. So um, yeah, there's benefits to all of it. Yeah. Because if you're needing, if you're at a place in that journey where you're needing maybe a bit more of that structure and you're going to come in and it feels like maybe a waste of your time because you're like, oh, it's so unstructured. What are we even doing here? Well, CBT can make you, oh, we've done this. We've done this. We've done this. We've done this. And I like to kind of bleed one into the next where it starts to be, okay, we do a bit of more formal CBT and now let's start to, oh, let's add a little bit of body work into this and then back to CBT and then over here, right? And you kind of blend one into the next as the client is at that place where they're ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of what makes you such an awesome therapist too. Well, thanks. <laughs> I mean, and really like you're, you're young. I mean, for those I listening, am. like you are a young therapist, but you're so kick-ass at what you do. And I think, I mean, I'm, I guess I am also young, but not as young as you, <laughs> but I, I was at one point and I remember uh, people coming in for their first session and being like, whoa, how old are you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was biggest insecurity for a long time was my age because I was like, nobody's going to take me seriously. Um, but now I've fallen back on like, if I'm not the counselor for you, I'm not the counselor for you. That's, that's right. totally okay. But also like, I have a ton of knowledge. So like, yeah, I, I can't help experience. you. My age isn't going to, yeah, but my age isn't going to be a deterrent of, of what I know and how I can help you. But if for whatever reason your stuff is coming up and, and I'm not going to be a fit for you, that's okay. I'm totally okay with that. I'll find someone for you who might feel more comfortable because you feeling safe with that therapist is a big piece of it, right? Yes. Yes. And also, I mean, this we have, I think, this idea of a therapist being someone who's older and wiser, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's not necessarily true, um, obviously, because here and we I are. And I think almost to <laughs> jump in there of like, I think maybe, and, and as a counselor, I'm going to put a positive spin on this. I think being younger and, and showing, allows me to show you I'm not the expert on this. Like mm -hmm. I have a lot of knowledge, but you're the expert on you and you know what's right for you. And that I'm not going to have that, right? That I can help you discover what it is for you. Um, but maybe people don't see me in that same expert lens. Maybe, I don't know, of I'm wise and I have all this experience. I have the answers, but no, you have the answers. Let's help you uncover what's right for you because I don't actually know what's right for you. I have a bunch of theory that says what might help, but like ultimately I don't actually know. I need to help you uncover it for you. That's right. And I think what you just hit on, Cecile, is really understanding what counseling is. And so this mm -hmm. idea, you know, I think we get this, this image or a common image of counseling is like laying on a couch and having someone with a clipboard, like yeah. diagnosing you and telling you what's wrong and telling you what you need to do. And that is, is not a, my approach to counseling or your approach no. to counseling, or I think even really what counseling is about it's about supporting somebody on a journey of self-discovery and knowing how to ask, the, like knowing what questions to ask that can help facilitate more learning and self-discovery and obviously yeah. offering tools and things that might support someone in figuring out who they are, what they yeah. need and where they want to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's something I struggle with because I do a lot of um, online social media type of stuff is I really struggle because people, um, a lot of people ask me questions, like a really direct question. And it's so hard because I, people look to me thinking I have the answer. And I'm like, ah, no, because without 
this full context of your entire life, I have no idea what's right for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had people reach out to me on social media and they'll send me like a little paragraph and they'll be like, Hey Cecile, so this happened with my boyfriend and like, what should I do? Yeah. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I have no idea because what's right for you and what patterns do you have in your relationships and how is your, you know, childhood impacting that pattern in the relationship, impacting the relationship itself. And what would be most healing for you? Would it be learning to stay in a relationship and work through the rupture that just happened? Or would it be learning that I don't have to stay in relationships that aren't serving me and leaving? I, I have no idea what's right for you. And I can't know that from one little paragraph. You are the only one who can know that you're the only one who can make that choice. But people think that we as counselors are like, ah, yes, the magic answer that's going to heal everything is right. X, Y, Z, right? Right. And that's that piece around like externalizing, thinking that, you know, a counselor is going to tell you the answer, fix your life. And, you know, counseling can help you find the answer and help you fix your life. But that comes from you. And so I yeah. like to say, you know, as counselors, our biggest job is supporting you in finding more connection with yourself and others in your life. Like that is, yeah. it's building your connection with yourself. That's what counseling is. And, you know, that's what I support people in doing by, you know, providing possible, possible tools, asking certain questions and Mm -hmm. building, supporting somebody and building awareness. And so, and yeah. And when you have that connection with yourself, you start to to be able to recognize what is right for you. And you start to be able to ask yourself the question more of, is this a pattern for me and what would feel most healing? And okay, I want to pull out of this relationship. Well, why is it that I want to pull out? Oh, it's because I'm afraid that they're going to leave me. So if I leave first, okay, so what do I want to do with that knowledge, right. right? But that has to come from within. And then it guides the choices that you want to make rather than us trying to tell you, hey, here's what you need to do. Yeah, and and any change, um, I mean, this is said all the time, but like the change has to happen from the inside. So any change, Absolutely. you know, if I were to say to a client, like, I think you need to break up with your boyfriend. And I think like- you're not going to do it because it's not coming from inside of you. Right. And it's like any change that you want to make has to be intrinsically motivated is what I'm getting at. It's like anything that you're going to make that's going to be sustainable has to come from you anyways. Um, So somebody telling you isn't going to, you listening to what someone else says doesn't often um, result in long-term change. So Yeah. 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 And our goal is to work ourselves out of a job, always. At least <laughs> always. I, <laughs> I say that to clients a lot. Absolutely. I want you to be able to start to do this, the questioning and the work by yourself. And that, you know, when you're done working with me, you have the tools and you're like, okay, I'm in a mucky part of my life again. Things are getting a bit hairy here. I'm going to reach for that. I'm going to reach for that. And these are the these are the things I know how to do to do some self-inquiry about what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, that is the goal. Yeah. I, I do want to add, though, of never feeling shame for wanting that support in that. Because I know for me, there was this belief that once I do counseling, I will be fixed and I can do it all on my own. And that really comes from this need for me to be independent, to never rely on anybody, to think I can do it all on my own. And so for me, part of my healing has been recognizing that I'm always going to need support and that, that there's nothing wrong with that, that I can learn all these tools, I can have all these skills. And I'm often still just going to want support to to talk it through or to move into my body. And you as the clinician can support me in that journey, even though I might be able to do it on my own. I just want someone there as I'm doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yes. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I still go to counseling. Same here. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that's because for me, it's, um, it's a sacred space where I get to go and I get to process and I get to be witnessed and supported in that. Yeah. And, um, it's just, it's a, a ritual or a habit or a way that I get to land in myself. It just, it, that's a big part of it for me. And obviously yeah. I have clients I've been seeing for a long time, but the thing is, is that the, the, the amount in which I go to counseling is mm-hmm. not, I don't go every week anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah. And th- there's certain clients that I don't see for months and they are like, Hey, can I see you? And I'm like, yep, yeah, come on in. And so the goal is, I guess, maybe when I say work myself out of a job, it's to make it so that clients are feeling more empowered um, and, you know, that they're needing less and less support. Yeah. Yeah, time. absolutely. That it's it's maybe like you say, those check-ins rather than those, I need you weekly, right? right. That we want to get you to this point where you are capable of asking for that help and support when you need it. And also capable of knowing that we're not the only way to get that. You have other people in your life that you can turn to for that, that you can turn inwards for that help and support. 
there's no shame in getting support and there's no shame in doing it alone, whatever that's works right. for you. Right. That's right. And that's, and that freedom, that's mm-hmm. what we're looking for. That right? choice, that, right? freedom, that, freedom, that, that choice, that choice yeah. that you get to choose and you get to maybe explore other types of therapy or work, you know? And so like, mm-hmm. as I continue on my journey, I start diving into different things and, you know, I've done some of the trauma yeah. work. So now I'm doing a little bit more, um, looking at dreams and, mm-hmm. and stuff mm-hmm. that feels like fun and yeah, not necessarily yeah. in my practice, but as an individual dream interpretation and, and, um, yeah, just different types of, of uh, self-work then can can come about once you you start with counseling and then it opens yeah. this whole whole world of uh, self-study. It really does, yeah. 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 Um, Cecile, you are such a powerhouse. And I um, are you still on TikTok a lot? I sh- yes, maybe a little bit less than I used to be because uh, it takes a lot of time. To be really okay. honest, it takes a lot of time. Um, and, and when I get busier, it it also takes, as you were saying, kind of at the beginning, it takes a lot of creativity Mm -hmm. to come up with some of these videos and to have ideas and to know how to present them in a way that's going to connect with people. And to be honest, when I feel busier with life, that creativity kind of, it's harder to access. And so then I'm there less. Um, and so right now I'd say I'm just a little bit busier in general with life. And so maybe I'm on TikTok a little bit less, but still creating videos, you know, a couple times a week. But there was a time there when I was like video a day, I was super like jazzed by it. And now I'm just like, I don't have the time to be committing to this. And I don't have, um, the creative juices, to be honest, flowing in the way right now that allows me to be creating that much content. Yeah. You were creating at one point, a lot of content. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, it has to be sustainable, right? And that's the thing yeah. that that I um, am managing right now. I think about, I've been really looking at like, what is my role on social media and how do mm-hmm. I want to show up on in this online community? And um, I, I'm always inspired by how you're doing it because the way that you show up is it's really as a resource. And so mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. inspiring for me to see like the content when you do put it out and how it's helpful for people. And um, so it's, it's great, but yes, you have to manage that because it takes yeah. so much time. <laughs> it does. And, you know, I've really shifted towards just trying to be like, not, um, not a perfectionist about it. Just like, you yeah. know what, here's some knowledge I have. Do you want it? And I do that a lot of my Instagram stories where, um, I've started just asking people, what questions do you want answered? And I don't even look at the question until I'm about to start filming. So it's not planned. And I'm just kind of like, here's all this stuff that I know about this. Take from it what you want. Um, and just so being really like almost raw about it, yeah. because I'm like that way I, it's really sustainable for me. It's just like talking for two minutes about a little topic. Good. I can do that. Um, but hopefully really educational for people because I also think my friends are really sick of me talking about trauma therapy and being like, did you know this is connected to that? Blah, blah, blah. So now I get to use Instagram almost as a platform to be like all the stuff that my friends are like, yes, the CEO, we know that's a trauma response. I can just tell all these people online who are like right. excited to hear it. Not and, want it, it and want to. And want to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. But that's been the, I mean, we had this conversation about a year ago about Instagram and stuff. And I, this, you know, you saying like letting go of the perfectionism and just like doing it. And I've seen you do that. And I've seen Mm -hmm. what the result of that has been really good because it is authentic. It's sincere Mm -hmm. and it's not put on. It's just you chit chatting and there's a big appeal for um, the listeners to be able to access you in that way. Yeah, I think the more authentic we are with anything, um, people connect to that, right? And I think that's true for for just being a human in life, whether it's on social media, wherever, just being ourselves, people can connect to that. And whenever I've done the really manicured, like, here's what I would like to say, and here is the, then that's not Cecile, right? That's not me. But if I'm just kind of like, blah, 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 here's some information, I'm probably going to go on for a tangent because that's who I am, let me double back. That's where people actually get to know the real Cecile, which I think people just connect to realness and, and yeah. authenticity, authenticity. Especially when we're counselors, like we're humans and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not experts, like we've said necessarily in the answers, but you know, mm-hmm. have expertise in the questions and some of the tools. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just showing up sincerely in these places, I think is really helpful because there's a mm-hmm. lot right now, a lot of information on the social media platforms around uh, mental health and mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. trauma and stuff. And not all of it is really good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And I like to really steer away from, at least in my content. And I know you don't do this often either, but like that really diagnostic language, like if you've experienced this, this, and this, then you have this, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. sometimes it can be helpful, but like, there's a lot of content that, um, is more diagnostic and I'm not meaning like medically diagnostic, but like really like putting these boxes around certain symptoms and stuff. And I think Mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. um, it can be alarming. Like I've had clients come to me and they're like, well, I read this thing on Instagram and like it, this means that I have this, this, this. And I'm like, well, let's just, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I like to, to use those things as like a, let's maybe start an exploration, but let's not take it as a, as a firm truth. Right. Yes. Um, and I have created videos like that actually, where I'll be like, Hey, um, if you experience this, this, this in your childhood, maybe you want to think about if there's trauma because these things yeah. can be really traumatic. Um, but let's start that as an exploration. This isn't me telling you this is what's happening. Let's look into this deeper. Let's start to understand. Um, and yeah, let's explore a little bit more. But that language is different. It's like, if you experience this, this, and this, let, like you might have trauma. Well, I'm talking about things that say like, if you do this, this, and this, and you are, wow, you know, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the stuff I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like, these are possibilities or things to look at. You are really good at, you know, providing examples and suggesting mm-hmm. Um, possibilities for people, but that's not always the case. And I know that some, some people can get really freaked out by some of the things like, oh and, and what I find interesting is if you dig into who is doing that, it is actually generally someone who is not a counselor. Yeah. <laughs> I do know how to say this gently. Um, so thank you for filling in my blank there. Uh, it's not usually someone with as much training in, in that area who's maybe taken a really complicated concept and has really just, um, simplified it to the point that it's no longer relevant. True. Yeah. It's not necessarily fully true. Whereas, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. And so people can follow you. Tell, tell them their, ha- your handle. Tell them yeah, how, they, how they find Tucker you. Counseling, counseling yeah. has two L's in BC. So counseling <laughs> with two L's. Um, and that's where I am on uh, social media, uh, sorry, TikTok and Instagram. Um, and then I have some cool things. If anybody's interested, I have this cool quiz that you can do um, to kind of understand how your trauma might be impacting your relationships today. And yes. then when you do that quiz, if you are willing to give me your email, I will send you a like a free workbook that you can do that kind of helps you kind of explore these things and really a self-guided um you know, Dee has been talking about a lot, the questions, we sometimes ask the right questions. And so that book is just me trying to ask the questions that might be relevant for you that you can then kind of answer yourself and maybe do some exploration for yourself. Awesome. And that is a really cool quiz. I've seen it. And I think it's really helpful, especially around um, relationships and things like that. And you're in Kamloops and you're, you're pretty busy, I think with clients, but you have some other people that are working with you. Yeah, I have right now two people who are working with me. Um, One is actually a counselor who did her practicum with me, who was so awesome that I kept her around after. Now she has her full counseling designation, all that stuff. And then another is a student who is doing her practicum with me right now. And I have one more lined up for May, maybe two more counselors lined up for May who are going to join me to do their practicum. So what uh, is cool about practicum students is that they're under my supervision, which means that you're still getting really good care, but their price is a lot lower because they Mm -hmm. don't... um, they don't have their full designation. So it's kind of a way that I try and help the community and get people call, um, reduced rate counseling who maybe can't afford, who don't have benefits for counseling, which can be really expensive. Well, why don't we do like something that helps both people? You come in, you see a counselor at a way reduced rate, and they get that training experience under direct supervision where they can still get the training that they need. And it's kind of a, a mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah, it's amazing. And then you're mentoring counselors at the same time and building that capacity within community. Do yeah. you do your people, do you do online counseling? Is that something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The counselor, Shayla, who did practice with me and now is the full counselor, she's actually only virtual. She doesn't okay. do in person. Uh, so she's like my fully virtual counselor. I'm mixture in person or online, whatever people want. And then same with practicum students, virtual or in person. I think I'm going to have a student potentially joining me who's fully virtual. Uh, so there'll be lots of options for like virtual counseling um, awesome. or in person in Kamloops. Okay. Yeah. So if people are interested in, in connecting with you or your team, um, your team is under WellMind Counseling. Yeah. Right? WellMind.ca would be the website. That's kind of what I call the team. Um, but also if you go to CecileTucker.com, it's going to redirect you to WellMind.ca, uh, which cool. is the, the business one. So yeah, if, if you can figure out my name, C-E-C-I-L-E, I can't even spell my own name, but C-E-C-I-L-E, <laughs> Tucker, last name's easy. If you, if you can remember that, you can find me pretty much anywhere. Okay. Well, I'll put it in the show notes and um, people can connect with you. Um, Yeah. Well, thank you. 
I mean, we could talk forever, but I just looked at the <laughs> clock and we've been here for an hour and 20. So, oh, damn. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. so cool. we'll, we'll call it that and maybe we'll have yeah. another one um, in the future, yeah. but it's this always so a lovely. pleasure, Cecile. Yeah. And I miss working with you. Um, I miss having you around. Yeah. But you just have such a great energy. And I, I think mm-hmm. that anyone who gets the opportunity to share space and do this work with you is, is, is really, it's a gift. So good work at, at, you know, healing and supporting all the people. (laughs) And same goes to you that I adore you. And I was thinking a couple of times throughout this, I was like, Oh, I want you to be my counselor, which uh, (laughs) would just be like the greatest joy, but obviously ethically not a thing, but just you're the type of counselor who I am drawn to. Oh, thanks, Cecile. You know, I think, um, and we've said this before, there's just something really special about um, friends that are also counselors, Mm -hmm. right? Like when Mm -hmm. we can have friendship and be counselors, because this work is not easy. Um, It's amazing. But there's there's just different nuances um, about living this life as a counselor. Mm -hmm. And when you have Mm -hmm. friends that are counselors, like that is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I value our friendship and I learn a lot I from you well. and, and yes. uh, we'll hang out when we're not being recorded sometime. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds excellent. Okay. Um, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, sorry. One last question. You have a workshop coming up. Is it sold out though? No, there's actually a couple tickets, but it is this coming Friday. So I don't know when okay. you're getting this out, but it's in a couple days here, okay, but I do but- have workshops fairly often. I'm hoping to do one every six weeks or so. And so if you go to wellmind.ca slash events, um, you can sign up to, to be notified whenever I have a workshop coming in there, all different topics, but all connecting back to trauma and how, you know, these different symptoms that we see of trauma, how they can connect to trauma. Um, so they're all kind of trauma informed workshops. And yeah, if you're interested in that, wellmind.ca slash events to just sign up to be notified when those are coming. Okay. I think that's great. And I wanted to mention that because you are busy. So getting in to be a client with you can be difficult, but workshops are a really great way to access your expertise and support for people that might not be able to get in and do counseling yeah. with you. So yeah, those absolutely. listening, if you're interested in working with Cecile, the workshops are a really good way to get in and um, work with her. So I'll put yeah. some info in the show notes about that too. Thank you. You're yeah. so welcome, Cecile. Thanks for so being been, here. So lovely talking to you as always. Mm-hmm.